Welcome back to the channels Tapa Alho Azul and Super Academico. Let us keep the reading of my book Phenomena. Today we will read the chapter 10. Don't forget to subscribe. Let's go. Chapter 10 The days in Frankfurt were really special. During the first week, I visited some tourist landmarks, including the house where Hegel was born in. I saw many of his original masterpieces even the one that commented on the famous dinner in which he had a vision that made him redirect many of his philosophical values which he'd exposed up to that point. The city was really beautiful. It was very old and had a lot of history in each of its buildings. Unfortunately, the time for tourism was too short and the weather was really harsh. It was too cold. I was familiar with the American Northeastern winter. Yet, I couldn't imagine that Central Europe would be so chilly. It got even colder at night time. Thus, I'd simply read as much as possible on the subjects that would be discussed in the classes I'd take. Fortunately, all the handouts were written in English. I tried to learn a little bit of German, but the time was way too short in order to learn a language that I had never studied before. I took advantage of the moments I spent on campus to talk to some students and professors. By the end of my first week there, I was quasi-totally familiarized with that place, which seemed so strange to me right upon my arrival. They were people just like me. Despite of having a different culture, they had the same sort of problems and thoughts I had. I wondered if Donny experienced a similar cultural shock when he got in Vietnam towards the end of 1969, it was probably even worse. During the summer sessions, I bumped a few more times into Antonio, the Brazilian student. For the most part, he wouldn't either talk about what he was or what was being done to him. I think he didn't want to be seen as some type of weirdo who gets possessed by the spirits of dead painters. Maybe that was why he'd speak so naturally about mediumism and paranormal phenomena. Anyway, he invited me to see the open seminar they would have after New Year's. I could hardly wait to see that show of paranormality, although I was trying not to show any enthusiasm. I am almost sure he would feel offended by that. He'd probably think I was looking at him as some sort of a showman, which wasn't true, but it was easier to just not go there. I would always bring a translator to class. People approached me there the same way I got approached at Harvard, only in a less superstitious fashion. My American culture seems to worship paranormal phenomena and even death in a more fantastic way. We might get influenced by our Hollywood. The German scientists looked at things in a more natural and professional way. In a way, they are pioneers in that field of study, at least in the Western world. Later on, I found out that the Orientals were over a thousand years ahead of us in terms of paranormality. My American colleagues from Harvard tried to show off their academic experience, but everything that they said or asked about seemed superficial or memorized to me, as if all of them were trying not to embarrass their country, as my father told me not to. I wouldn't speak much. Most of the time I only observed. I got very impressed with a Swiss parapsychologist that spoke very assertively about certain theories such as the ghastly generation of the spectral aura that supposedly enlightened the living and that remained unchanged after their death. At a certain point, I noticed that there was some connection with the spectra photographs taken by Dr. Hauptmann and Dr. Handrevam. In fact, it wouldn't really capture the ghost itself but only the aura around it. Later on, some people claimed they could pictures of one's aura which supposedly revealed his personality. They said they were like fingerprints, everyone has their own and there is no such thing as identical auras. However, some doctor by the name Vanya Iam made a lot of statements in that respect, in a very self-assertive way. I knew that being self-assertive was important in order to successfully pursue an academic career, but I wondered whether or not she wasn't committing herself too much to such vague theories through her statements. I wished her good luck. I would spend all my spare time by myself. I'd occasionally speak to the other five students from Harvard, Stan Regis, Claire Hollins, Francis Hyerald, Walter Spance and Laurie Valor, but we weren't that close. They were all seniors and, besides their natural disdain towards freshmen, although we were so far away from Harvard, there was also the issue of the test. I think they didn't really accept handle the fact that a freshman scored higher than them very well. After all, they were a senior group, which means that they'd gone through almost all coursework subjects. Anyways, I'd use all the time I spent by myself to take a few notes and well as to write to that crowd that came to say goodbye to me at the airport the day I left for Germany. The one I enjoyed writing to the most was Anne. I'd always start off by saying, Dear Anne, Europe is pretty. You should be here. I imagine the expression on her face while she'd read that. A lot of times in Frankfurt I wondered if I'd experienced some phenomena. I was both hopeful and apprehensive, 
The closer we got to Christmas and New Year's, the more I started to feel homesick and curious to see my Brazilian colleague's performance. It wondered if it was really true that the spirits of deceased painters showed up during the sessions and felt at peace. Maybe I'd be able to see them and feel just as peaceful. I tried to set my mind from those depressing doubts and feelings. I was having a real hard time being so far away from home feeling lonely and sad. Christmas Eve was almost unbearable. Due to the time zones, it happened in Germany before it did in the States. Therefore, I got on the phone and called Hall a little ahead of schedule. I bet my mother cried again when she talked to me. Ranha was the only one who was able to restore my feeling of self-confidence and happiness. Just hearing her voice pronouncing my same name from so far away made me feel cheerful all over again. I had supper with other foreign students that evening. Antonio was there, so we shut the breeze for a long time. I had to control myself not to tap into the issue of his forthcoming presentation. The food was not as tasty my mom's, but it was edible. A Jewish student tried to pass on the food, due to Hanukkah, yet he ended up eating a little bit. Despite being away from our families and friends, we managed to have a good time. I just survived my first Christmas away from home, the first of many. New Year's went by us just like Christmas Eve. I looked forward for the day I'd finally get to see Antonio's presentation, which was the object of study of certain scientists at that university. The classes were not as attractive now as they seemed to be in the beginning. I even sit in one class taught by the two scientists that had been in Harvard. It was an exact copy of their back home. I wondered if they would ever move out of that stage and evolve up to a higher level of understanding. They'd return to Germany just to record Antonio Gastaretto's presentation. Besides, I was also curious to see those two into action. I found them funny sometimes, especially when they'd point out to those white stains and say it was a soul. Gee, if they only saw what I saw. That day finally arrived. I sat in the middle of the audience. The front row was all taken by professors and scientists from that university. The students and some other curious were all sitting in the back. I believe they were afraid something could go wrong and hinder the project, mainly because they planned on documenting the whole process. Antonio seemed very calm standing in front of everyone. He said he was used to doing that in Brazil. Hence his familiarity with it. He waved at me when he saw me shortly before he started. The two of photographers were ready. They had planted cameras in eight strategic spots in that room. Dr. Iam was holding two notepads. I myself brought my notebook along just in case. I had never had the opportunity to previously make an appointment in order to be able to see a phenomenon. They'd simply happen. That's why I couldn't afford not to write everything down in detail. The Dean of the School Ladies and gentlemen, today you will witness something called mediumistic painting. This young man over here, Antonio Gastaretto, came all the way from Brazil just to give us the opportunity to observe such uncommon phenomenon. Thus, I ask you both to remain quiet during his presentation and to cooperate with the photographers that will record this event by not standing in front of the ones that would be working in the back of this room. Therefore, the best thing for you to do is just to remain seated. Your questions will be answered in the order they are received and if we have time to do so in the end. Thank you. Everybody stop talking. Antonio was sitting at this table with lots of painting materials at his disposal. Some sort of monitor was placed next to him. Everybody was waiting for the grand finale. I observed the expression on all the faces around me. I noticed that only Antonio remained calm. He didn't do anything, just waited. I must have been the first one, besides Antonio, to sense certain heaviness in the atmosphere. Everybody was apprehensive regarding his presentation and that was beginning to get to me. Yet, I knew that was not that alone. Instinctively, I began to write down what I was feeling. And then there it was. I saw it crystal clear. There was a person standing next to Antonio. I've never been an art expert, but I leafed through some encyclopedias in order to learn more about the painters Antonio said he'd incarnate, the reason why I say that is because the painter didn't take over his body. He simply stood next to him. I could see that he'd lead Antonio's hands as a magnet would to a piece of metal and would move to the command of his hands. He was a middle-aged man who was wearing clothes from the past century, no doubt about it. It took me a while till I recognized his face from a magazine I'd looked at, it was Degard. Then Antonio started painting. I was impressed. Just by keeping his hands free and his eyes closed, he'd be done painting in a matter of minutes. And always with an awesome clarity. 
Even when he'd start with a mere blot on the screen, he'd manage to end up with a beautiful masterpiece. The monitor would occasionally speak to him and he'd answer it in French. And he'd do that very naturally. He'd tell it who he was, and sometimes, what he was doing. I looked to the ghost and saw no reaction to the questions. He'd just keep on leading Antonio's hands. Apparently, the human ability to lose concentration before hardship was taken for granted by the spirits. He managed to talk without turning his attention away from what he was doing. That was fascinating. When he was done painting, he'd sign his masterpieces just like the original artists would. Everyone got fascinated at how faithful his assigning was to the famous deceased artists. At least, the graphologists did. Shortly before he finished painting the fifth masterpiece by Degard, I could already feel certain peacefulness in the air. Antonio had already told me that it happened. He said the artist would set his creativity free and, consequently, that way, would pass their peace of mind onto him. Thank God, I was able to pick up on that as well. He signed the fifth painting. Degard remained standing for a while before disappearing up in the air. I think it took a little bit of time before he could unplug from Antonio. I looked Degard straight in the eyes. He had no specific facial expression. I couldn't quite make out whether that was his normal personality or just a pattern. Besides the experience with Donnie, that was the first time I looked a ghost straight in the eyes. Perhaps that had to do with the artist's ordinary concentration, although he was no long alive. Antonio started to open his eyes slowly. He didn't seem any different, only his hands were dirty and he was a little sweaty, after all, it was his body that made all the physical effort. The photographers continued to work for a while, even though Antonio had already finished painting. Differently from me, they didn't know Degard was already gone. I wasn't able to talk to Antonio after his presentation. I in fact, I only bumped into him a few days later. Yet, that didn't change our relationship at all. I wrote five pages worth of notes and, in spite of all my persisting doubts, I was happy for having had the opportunity to witness such phenomenon, especially because I was able to take lots of notes and draw so many conclusions. That experience was the most worthwhile thing that happened to me during my stay in Germany. That was what gave me background knowledge in order to start writing my first book. It would be more personal than scientific, but I had to expose all that that I had already seen and discovered, at least, up that point. It would be strong, sensitive, and emotional. As for the ghostly pictures, they only captured the usual. During the exhibition that took place on the following week, Antonio and I saw them and, there were just a lot of lights around him. I didn't tell him I'd seen to guard. However, as I'd look at the pictures and remember where he was standing, I realized that the so-called aura really did exist. Besides, in spite of being more comprising than Degard himself, the lights indicated a spectral presence more or less in the same spot where he did his painting. The concepts and theories exploded in my mind and I had no choice other than get on with my life. At the end of the summer session, I said goodbye to some people that I had gotten acquainted with. I had acquired a lot of experience and many books. Unfortunately, they didn't let me bring any pictures back home. I said goodbye to Antonio we didn't really become friends, but in a way, we became partners. Both of us were able to understand beyond human ability, yet, we were very humane. We had a different way of looking at life, especially because, at least in my case, we sensed and saw things that most people wouldn't. We wrote down each other's address. We had no clue what the future held for us. However, we knew we'd eventually see one another again. That way we'd know how far we'd have gone. I had to go back home now. In my luggage, I was carrying lots of learning and questioning. My notes were in my hands. We'd always walk hand in hand from now on. And, in my suitcases, I didn't pack anything and asked me to get her, just a Christmas gift for mom and another one for Ranha. I could hardly wait to see everyone.